Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Red's Minor League Talk. Uh, I skipped last week, things just got busy, and you know, I figured with the start of the season happening, uh, it had only been underway for a couple of days, that it, it wasn't going to be a big deal, and I just pick up this week from basically, you know, a week and a half in. Um, it is currently Monday afternoon, and it's an interesting day because there's really only one game on the schedule. Um, both Daytona and Dayton were scheduled for off days, so it's only going to be a half schedule anyways, but Louisville already got rained out despite the game not starting for another five hours. Um, but, you know, I thought we'd uh, kind of talk about some of the early things that have happened this season. Um, Hunter Green made his debut last week. Um, looked really good. Now, the, the stat line, three innings pitched, five hits, two earned runs, no walks, eight strikeouts. Obviously, you, you have to love no walks, eight strikeouts. Um... Yeah, five hits. I mean, you 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 kind of you want to do better than that, of course, but it, it, it it's not a really big deal. Um, you know, he he threw 53 pitches, 35 strikes. Uh, the one thing that kind of stood out, other than you know clearly, you know, big time fastball, really good slider, is that he only threw one changeup in the game. Uh, he kind of talked about that after the game and mentioned you know he needs to work on how he gets out left-handers, getting more comfortable getting left-handers out, which. You know, he didn't say the change up specifically, but right-handed pitchers, generally the pitch they go to to get left-handers out is the change up. Um, so that that's kind of the thing that maybe I'd say look for in the future. He's he's scheduled to start... Um, oh, I just kicked the camera, so <laughs> sorry about that. Um, he's scheduled to start on Wednesday. Uh, he was actually supposed to start this weekend, but uh, Dayton was... Rained out, snowed out, sleeted out, iced out all three days uh, up in Midland, Michigan. They were going to take on the Great Lakes Loons, but yeah, that that didn't happen. So uh, both he and Wendell and Bautista got pushed from their weekend starts to Tuesday and Wednesday now. So uh, they will be very well rested, um, hopefully ready to go on Tuesday and Wednesday when uh, the Dragons are back home in Dayton. Um, going up a level, Daytona, uh, they started out... 8-1 and one on the season. They've lost their last two games. But, man, that, that offense down there. I mean, the Florida State League, it's tough to hit there as it is. I mean, it's the toughest place to hit in all of minor league baseball. You've got big ballparks. The weather doesn't really play nice. Um, you know, <laughs> as a team right now, I'm looking at it. They're hitting 284 with a 380 on base percentage and a 470 slugging percentage. I mean, that's an 851 OPS. Now, granted, we're talking 11 games, so... Clearly, small sample size alert, but generally speaking, the last 10 years or so, the league OPS has been about 650. So they're they're 200 points above where the general team falls uh, throughout the season. I mean, as a team, they've got 42 walks and 66 strikeouts. They've got multiple players that have walked more times than they've struck out. Uh, let me see here. Uh, TJ Friedel's got seven walks and six strikeouts. Taylor Trammell has eight walks, six strikeouts. Tyler Stevenson's got six walks and four strikeouts. Bruce Yari's got seven walks, eight strikeouts. I mean, the, the, the team is just hitting. They're seeing the ball incredibly well. Um, Mitch Ney. Now, Mitch Ney's a former first-round draft pick, and he actually came over to the Reds in the minor league version of the Rule 5 draft this past offseason. Unfortunately, you know, for Mitch Ney, he got injured. He hurt his leg, um, and then he ended up, he needed a surgery of some kind got a staph infection after that. And basically, it cost him like two, two and a half seasons. Uh, he just he wasn't able to get healthy. And even when he came back last year, reports were that he, he wasn't really 100% yet. Um, now, who knows what it's going to turn out to be, but uh, it, it seems like so far he's making up for lost time. He's hitting 342 for Daytona. He's got three home runs already, so he's, he's slugging 658. Um, you know, other than Tyler Stevenson, he's got the highest OPS on the team, 1,033. Uh, interesting guy. He's 24, so he, he's definitely older than you'd like to see somebody be in the Florida State League. But again, he's essentially missed the last two seasons due to injury and battles with health issues. Um, you know, again, he, talented guy. He went in the first round a couple years ago. He's a big guy. I saw him out in spring training, and he's listed at like 6'4", I think 210. He looks bigger than that, and not in like a you know big, out-of-shape way. Like, he's a, he, he looks put together. Um I don't know. Interesting guy. I like to pick up for the Reds, and at least for at least for now, it, it, it's paying off pretty well. Um, you know, the big thing that's kind of happened since we last talked is 
And Eugenio Suarez got hurt, and Nick Senzel is still in AAA. Now, I've talked about this on a lot of my other appearances, my own podcast, other podcasts I've appeared on, radio. I've written about it a little bit, so th- this may be something that's a little uh, repetitive, but uh, I think there's a little bit of a new twist to it uh, that I haven't covered a ton. Um, when Suarez went down with his injury, the Reds shifted Nick Senzel from second base where he had been playing, and where the stated plan was for him to play all year, or at least the whole time he was in Louisville, uh, over to third base. He played a few games there, and then it seemed like everybody understood that they were kind of waiting until last Friday to call him up, because that would be the day, that's the magic day that they could call him up and still get that extra year of team control before he hits free agency. Well, that didn't happen. They didn't call him up on Friday, and at the same time, they also sent him back to second base. Now, that coincided with the Reds seemingly getting good news on Suarez, that you know, maybe he's not going to miss six to eight weeks. Maybe it's only going to be four weeks he's going to be out with a broken thumb. Now, obviously, that's good for the Reds. You you, you want a Eugenio Suarez back in your lineup. Uh, but what was interesting about it is that, you know, for... I, how do I want to say this? Basically, they, they jumped... They alleviated their... Alleviated? That's not the word I want to say. Basically, they, they changed their plans for basically, you know, six to eight weeks on what they were going to do with Nick Senzel. Or so it seemed. You know, they were going to put him at, it, it appeared they were going to put him at third base. Um, his future is not going to be at third base in this organi- organization, it doesn't seem. I feel like that that's, that's Suarez's spot. And I, the, the short-term thinking there was weird. Um, maybe it did, maybe part of the reason they put him back at, uh, put Sinzel back at second base is the brutal start the Reds are out at, or out to, and they just decided, you know, this season, I mean, it, it's, it, as tough as it is to say on April 16th, it, it's a lost season already. I mean, they'd have to be they'd have to be on pace to win 90 something games, to even get back into competition uh, for a wild card at this point. I mean, that's it's not entirely implausible, but yeah, it's very unlikely, which I guess would make it implausible. But I'm good with words, guys. I'm sorry, but yeah, I'm I'm just not sure that I understand the the short term thinking on that move. If, if you see Sinzel being your future second baseman, which I think that they do, keep him at second base. Um, you know, you, you, could, you brought up Alex Blandino, and I'm sure you've heard me rant about this a lot too. So for some reason, he's basically splitting his playing time with Cliff Pennington, 34-year-old, 650 career OPS Cliff Pennington, on a rebuilding team going nowhere. For some reason, that that makes sense to share time with a 25-year-old who's hit well in AAA. I don't understand. Um, nobody seems to understand. Even the Reds' TV crew was openly wondering why this is happening the other day. Uh, when you get those guys kind of questioning what's happening, uh, you, you know that no one understands what's going on. Um, I know I certainly don't. I'm sure you don't. I... I don't know. There, there's. I, I wrote it before. Uh, there's, a, there's a weird disconnect going on in this organization that doesn't make sense. It seems like the front office wants one thing. They kind of tiptoe, and I kicked the camera again because I'm trying to tiptoe down here. Just dip their little toes in the water of this one idea, but then they don't really fully commit to it. And then Brian Price does, well, I've, who knows. Whatever, whatever it seems to work for him. It doesn't seem to matter if the front office is bringing in guys to do a certain role. If, if that's not what Brian Price wants, then that's not what's going to happen. And, I mean, we saw it last year with Robert Stevenson coming up, and he was basically buried in the bull, bullpen and pitched once a week. And then after seven weeks of that, Dick Williams finally kind of stepped in and sent him to AAA. And I think it was telling that he said, well, we needed to send him there so we could get more work. Well, yeah. Why didn't you just tell your manager, hey, you've got to pitch him more? I, I, I don't know. There's, there's, a, there's weird things going on in this organization I don't get. Um, I, I feel that, you know, when you're in a rebuilding mode, that you need to play the young guys. And it just seems for the last two years, they haven't really made that happen. I mean, Jesse Winker comes up and, I mean, it wasn't until September that he really got normal amounts of playing time, despite being called up three or four times before that. Uh, we saw with Robert Stevenson, like I just mentioned, Alex Blandino comes up, he's not playing, um, 
you know, Philip Urban's getting more playing time now because, you know, both Shevler and Jesse Winker aren't really able to play. Um, but I think that he probably needs to see more playing time, particularly in center field. We know what Billy Hamilton is. Unfortunately, it's not what we wanted it to be. But expecting different results at this point is kind of crazy. So, you know, give Philip Urban chances to play in center field and see what happens. Uh, maybe it doesn't work. But we already know what we've got out there doesn't work. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm just rambling on now at this point. But it, it's it's been a rough start to the season, and there've been a lot of things going on that I just can't wrap my head around. Particularly when it comes to calling up guys from the minor leagues and not really doing anything with it. But I guess let me get back to something with you know I started this whole thing out with Nick Senzel and kind of got way way off topic, but. I feel that it's still pertinent to kind of the minor leagues and what's been going on. But uh, because they didn't call up Senzel already, I, I think we're probably going to have to wait until late May, early June, until we get past that Super 2 date, uh, which basically for those who don't understand what that is, um, if he were to get called up excuse me, before that date happens, then he would be eligible for four years of arbitration, which in the long run would probably cost the Reds anywhere from 5 to $10 million. Um, but if they wait until after that date, then they only have to pay him three years of arbitration. So they, they'd save money that way, and, I mean, honestly, at this point, it makes sense. The Reds aren't going anywhere. I think Nick Sinzel is going to improve this lineup for sure, but does it matter at this point? I mean, it, it, it doesn't. They're, they are what they are. They're not going to be contending this year. So, you know, save that money in the future, and please, God, spend it when it actually is there to be spent. Um... But it, it just makes sense from an organizational standpoint to keep him down for the next six weeks, five, six weeks, and get past that date and just make sure that, you know, you, you, you save that money and hopefully they spend it when it's there. Um, now, I did ask for a few questions on Twitter um, for this, and so I'm going to kind of let me look and see what we've got now. Um, you know... As you know, assuming the Mets inquire about Devin Mesoraco, what's the realistic return we could get for him? Um, one, I, I don't think the Mets would inquire about Devin Mesoraco. I like Devin Mesoraco. He seems like a really good guy, but he hasn't hit for four years. He's not hitting this year. I mean, wh why would anybody call and ask about Devin Mesoraco? Aside from him being healthy, I feel like he's so far down the list of people you would try and bring in to be your starting catcher right now. Like, I, I wouldn't give up anything for him. And you'd have to pay all of his salary. I mean, that, 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 I, I, that I'm just trying to be realistic here. I, I don't understand why anybody would call and say, hey, we want Devin Mesrock, and we'll give you anything for him. There, there's, the track record isn't there. He hasn't been able to stay healthy for four years. Um, not playing well right now. He's not playing much either. So I, it's not like, you know, he's gotten full playing time and he's hitting a buck fifty. Tucker Barnhart's the guy, and Devin Mesrocco's, you know, he's backing up and playing every couple of days. But I, I just don't see why anybody would give anything up for him right now, even if you ate some of that salary. Um, you know, Ariel Hernandez, clear waivers. I have no idea. Um, it, it may take up to 10 days from the time that that move was announced. Uh, they don't have to necessarily put him on waivers immediately. They've got a couple of days to do that um, once you designate him for assignment. Um you know, then it all depends on, you know, is can you work out a trade with somebody who does want him? Um, you know, there, there, there's a lot of moving parts with that. So we, we may not know for a couple more days at this point. Um, you know, somebody asked about Sinzel. I kind of covered that a little bit. Um, you know, talk about Tyler Stevenson a little bit. Um, I, mean, I talked about him a little bit earlier. I'm actually working on something for The Athletic. Hopefully it'll be out this week on Stevenson and kind of what he's gone through over the past couple of years with the injuries and you know, what he's learned from that and kind of looking forward. Um, but, I mean, what I saw in spring training was uh, improved power from Tyler Stevenson. You know, I think that last year we saw him take a big step forward um, in terms of his plate discipline, which was very nice to see. Uh, we're seeing it again this year. I mean, as I mentioned, he's got more walks and strikeouts this year. I'd be surprised if that held up in the long run because very, very few guys walk more than they strike out. But, I mean, even last year he was pretty close. Uh, and I, I think that being in that, you know, pretty close range, I mean, that's that's not going to be unexpected from my point of view on what to expect from Tyler Stevenson. Um, usually catchers are guys that have good plate discipline, 
probably comes from, you know, them catching, and so they see a lot more pitches than other guys do. So they can probably read spin a little bit better. They've got a better idea of maybe how pitchers want to attack them because they kind of have to get out there and call games against other hitters and figure out how they would attack themselves. Um, and so, you know, I, I think the, the strides that he made last year at the plate in terms of plate discipline helped a lot. Uh, being healthy now, I'm sure that's very, very beneficial for him. I spoke with him out in spring training. He said he's feeling great, feeling healthy. Everything was good to go, and <laughs> it sure seems like it is so far this year. But um, with the Florida State League, as I mentioned, it's a tough place to hit. Obviously, it's, it hasn't been tough so far for him, but um, it's it, it's the toughest place to hit in the minor leagues. Huge ballparks. The weather doesn't really play very nice. Um, now, fortunately, Daytona does play in the most hitter-friendly park in the entire Florida State League, so that helps. But um, I, I think he's going to hit for a lot more power this year, but I think that some of that's also going to be hidden by the league that he's playing in. And when he moves up to Pensacola, we'll have to see. Uh, ever since they moved the field or the, uh, the fence back in Pensacola, we've gotten two seasons out of that. And one year, the fence seemed like it really did some damage to hitters, but the next year, it didn't. So we'll we'll kind of have to pump the brakes on that one and see. I don't really know how the park's going to play this year. Um, they're out on the bay, so the wind patterns really come into play in, in that ballpark. And um, so I don't know. We'll we'll have to see on that. But I, I, I like what I've seen from Tyler Stevenson over the last year and a half. Uh, you know, wish I could have seen it more last year, but unfortunately he did get hurt. Hopefully he can stay healthy this year. I think if he stays healthy this year, he's going to be a top 100 prospect in all of baseball by the end of the season. Um, the, the the talent is there. It's just a matter of him being able to stay on the field and get the repetitions to just continue improving his game. But, um, yeah, I think that's it for today. I have no idea how long I've been recording this, but I'm going to cut it off there. I feel like it's probably been a good 15 minutes or so. But uh, until next week, guys, uh, thanks for watching. If you like this, subscribe, give it a thumbs up. Check out RedsMinorLeagues.com if somehow you found this video without knowing about the site. I don't know how you would have done that, but if you did, that's where I write about the Reds farm system every day, pretty much every day of the year, even during the off season. So if that's interesting to you, then you know please please check it out. But all right, see ya.